Our next speaker today is uh, Dr. Neil Dyer. He's with the NDSU Veterinary Diagnostic Lab, and we've asked him to speak to us about common beef diseases in North Dakota. And I suspect it's going to have to be the abridged version, or otherwise uh, um, we might be here all day or maybe a whole semester. But with that, Dr. Dyer, are you available? I am. Let me see if I can do this here. Is that come? There we go. Okay. Yeah, let's uh, let's get started. We'll we'll talk about some of the things actually that have been that have been hit already, and I'll try to highlight um, the kinds of things that we see at the veterinary diagnostic lab. And so um, there's going to be some some pictures here to look at, but um, as you say, I'm going to have to get the important stuff. Um, I, I want to break this really into four categories today that that uh, I think com would represent the types of things that uh, that we see uh, respiratory disease or pneumonia. Diseases that look like there's something wrong with the nervous system, uh, diseases of the digestive system, and then a couple of things just about uh, about muscle and, and the skeletal system, and those kind of make up the the bulk of what we see. Um, I want to start about about talking about respiratory disease in cattle, um, what everybody refers to as pneumonia, but now, at least in the um, in the veterinary world, it's more often referred to as bovine respiratory disease complex, or BRDC. And the reason that they do that is because, as Jerry already pointed out and Charlie's talked about, there are lots of things that go into making an animal develop respiratory disease. And I'm not going to talk about things that we've already talked about, but you can see that that list has already come up today. And, and so there's a lot of things that contribute to whether or not an animal actually develops pneumonia. And when you, when you talk about the environment, again, um, Things that we've that we've mentioned related to you know what that animal is exposed to, how much stress is presented with, what kind of nutritional condition it's in, and and that last or the, or the middle bullet there about ventilation and, and exposure to ammonia, I think is is worth mentioning. Um, that's going to be dependent a little bit upon what what the housing situation is for each uh, for each individual animal, but but ammonia will sort of destroy some of the protective qualities of the um, of the uh, of the lung and the airways and and when that happens it can kind of predispose an animal to problems with with uh, pathogenic organisms um, so w when I think about what causes respiratory disease in in cattle really there's there's four viruses that that uh, probably most of you have, have heard of um, and most of you vaccinate for or think about vaccinating for, and that's going to be BVD, BRSV, IBR, and then and the uh, PI3 or parainfluenza virus. So the reality of this is, as far as true respiratory disease, the, the top two are the two that, that um, we see most commonly contributing to respiratory disease in cattle that come through the diagnostic lab. IBR is primarily in a, in a, an abortion agent in cattle anymore. Most cattle have been exposed to IBR and they actually carry that herpes virus in their system, you know, it would be heifers that would be more at risk for, for IBR, uh, especially unvaccinated animals that would tend to have abortion problems. Uh, but it's always included in the respiratory group, so, so there it is. And then parainfluenza is really not a, a significant pathogen in cattle. It can be a predisposing virus, but again, it's part of that group that, that shows up in most uh, multiple vaccines. So just I'm going to have just a word to say about about each one of these and show you a few pictures. Traditionally, BVD, as as, as Dr. Stucka talked about earlier, you know, is almost thought of as a um, as a reproductive pathogen or even a, a digestive pathogen. But the truth of the matter is that that um, I would say in the last couple of decades, it's it's floated to the surface as a respiratory pathogen in cattle, and. Uh, uh, any more, I would say that I find BVD positive cases more often in, uh, in cases of pneumonia than I do in cases of abortion or, or digestive disease. So it, it has a real place in the respiratory group. Uh, as far as what it looks like, um, you know, any of these viruses can cause oculonasal discharge. So they've got fluid running out of their nose and their eyes. They're running a fever. They're having trouble breathing. Um, they may develop some diarrhea just as a as kind of a nonspecific cause, and they may or may not get oral ulcers. I know people think about oral ulcers with BVD, but but they don't always happen. Uh, if they do, it's certainly a nice clue, but they, it, that that sign can't always be relied on. BRSV, I think, is probably the number one respiratory pathogen in cattle, and uh, 
uh, you can see the list of um, of clinical signs there that go along with a BRSV infection. Um, I think this is a really tough virus to identify. Uh, some of you who have submitted tissue to the diagnostic lab um, have, have probably found out how it's tough to identify BRSV. It, it's, it's, a, it's a fragile virus and it's not always detectable in tissue for very long. So I think there are plenty of cases that are, have actually had BRSV involved but it has not been identified from a, you know, from a diagnostic standpoint. Um, however, it does pop up with, with a fairly frequent, um, you know, with, with a fairly good frequency, and uh, we have a couple of different tests that we use to identify BRSV in tissue. The best way to protect, you, protect yourself against this, as, as you heard about in the previous uh, discussion, was, was to, is to vaccinate for it because, uh, you know, it, it's, it can be a real problem and it'll hurt. And I'll talk a little bit more about it um, as a co-infection. Here's a picture of a lung that's got a BRSV problem. And, and really, the, I don't know if I can get the, if you can see the pointer on here or not, but you, you see all these... Um, clear spaces in between the, the lung lobe tissue. And that's a pretty um, pretty typical finding for a viral pneumonia. You get a lot of kind of emphysema in the lung and, and, and the virus is distributed pretty evenly through the lung. So the whole thing feels kind of firm, almost almost like a, um, oh, like a piece of liver would feel. And, and that's pretty typical for viral pneumonias. You get this even distribution all the way throughout the lung. And, and so if you do happen to open up one of these animals and look, that might be kind of a general clue for you. Uh, as to what you might be dealing with. As I said, IBR is a herpes virus. Um, it, it does cause respiratory disease in cattle or upper respiratory disease. Uh, it's also a reproductive problem, as I said, in cases of abortion. It can cause some neurologic disease as well. So herpes viruses across species, not just cattle, but just about anything that can have a herpes virus, tend to act like this. Um, it's, it's known as, as red nose as well. And again, this is a disease that is just smart to vaccinate for. Not so much because it would keep respiratory disease out of a group of cattle, but more because it, it prevents abortions. And, uh, and so I, that just makes good sense. Tends to have higher mortality in calves. And again, this just makes sense too, because animals that are infected with herpes viruses will develop immunity to them. And so calves aren't gonna have as, as uh, strong an immunity as an adult cow. And, and so if, if animals do get ill from this virus, it's usually going to be the younger animals. They're going, to be, they're going to become immune to it as they get older, and they'll actually become carriers, and they'll shed it into the environment. And there's not much you can do about that because, you know, it's just out there, uh, except for vaccinating. Um, so, so stressed adult animals can shed this virus into the environment and be a source of the virus uh, if, if animals are vaccinated. Um, hopefully most of them will be protected by the vaccination or just by natural exposure of the virus. You'll get some natural immunity from that in the herd as well. So here's a picture of what classic IVR looks like. And what this is is a trachea or a windpipe opened up. You can see that needle open, uh, holding the, the uh, voice box open and all that kind of cruddy looking lining tissue here in the trachea. That's all just dead cells and inflammatory material sloughed off. And this is what classic IBR looks like. It causes this, this inflammation of the trachea or the windpipe. The, the, the truth, though, is that I hardly ever see this at the diagnostic lab. It's a pretty uncommon lesion now. And the reason is because people vaccinate for IBR. And, and it's, it's a pretty uncommon, uh, pretty uncommon finding anymore. Uh, the only thing I'm going to say about PI3 is that, uh, that it's really not a big deal. Um, it, it's more of a predisposing infection, uh, and so animals that have a parainfluenza infection might develop a secondary bacterial problem. But if you vaccinate for this, I think you're pretty well protected, and it's, it's really not much of an issue in cattle. It's just included in that in a lot of those vaccines um, that, are, that are marketed as, as uh, multiple viral vaccines. So, um, so that, that's, that's the virus group, but again, BRSV and BVD would be the two big respiratory uh, viruses in cattle. When you talk about bacteria, it's a longer list, um, and certainly uh, of, of the ones that are listed there, uh, Mannheimia would be um, an important bacteria, what used to be called uh, Pasteurella hemolytica is now called Mannheimia hemolytica. 
The other one uh, is, is Histophilus somni, or what used to be called Haemophilus somnus. That's capable of causing pneumonia all by itself. And then one that's kind of reared its ugly head here in the last 10 years is Mycoplasma bovis. And this is kind of a wild card because um, this organism is capable of doing a lot of things in cattle that are, are kind of a problem. Besides just pneumonia, I've seen it in cases of abortion, certainly inner ear infections, arthritis cases, mastitis cases. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about Mycoplasma bovis, but, but they are developing some vaccines. There are some drugs that are labeled for this pathogen, but it's, it, it's, it's kind of nasty, and, uh, and it's one that you have to pay attention to. The other ones there, the pastorella organisms and the actinomyces, those are sort of secondary problems. They, they show up after the damage has already started, and they just create havoc. They just make things worse. So of the bacteria that can actually cause pneumonia all by themselves, Mannheimia and Histophilus and Mycoplasma would be the three to, to watch for. Mannheimia causes what's typically thought of as shipping fever pneumonia, um, and, and that's able to, that, that can kill cows all by itself. The thing to remember is that most of these bacteria can be found on the tonsils of healthy animals. Uh, if I were to culture some tonsil tissue at a slaughterhouse, I could probably find all of these. So the, the take home message there is um, stress is what turns these bacteria loose or some kind of a viral infection turns these bacteria loose and lets them um, cause the disease that they cause. But they can, they can be found in healthy animals and not do anything at all. So um, Mannheimia, as I said, is the, is the agent that causes classic shipping fever and ammonia. Uh, in, in, in cattle that develop problems with this, it can come on quickly and it can kill them quickly. They'll run fevers and they'll be in trouble before you know it. There are bacterins out there for it. Um, and and uh, often what happens in cases of shipping fever and pneumonia is that when the, it, when the cow's immune system is trying to get rid of the bacteria, it actually causes more damage than the bacteria does. And so the body ends up sort of hurting itself. And... and uh, and part of the way to treat this problem is to actually see if you can cool off the immune system a little bit with anti-inflammatory drugs because the animal is kind of turning, or the lung is sort of turning on itself to create a more severe pneumonia. And here's a picture of, a, this is a classic shipping fever lung. This line here shows, if I can get this to work, it shows the difference between normal lung. Above the line is normal, where it looks kind of pink, and below the line is abnormal, where it looks kind of dark brown or red. That dark brown part of the lung is just as solid as a piece of liver. You can't breathe through that at all. And that's a real common distribution for bacterial pneumonia. All of that, all of that inflammation is on the bottom side of the lung or the downside of the lung because that's where the bacteria drop, and that's where the inflammation occurs. So if you open one of these up and you see a, a, a real distinct line like that, you're very likely dealing with a bacterial pneumonia, uh, at least in part. And, um, and, and these, are, these are tough to turn around. You have to get them really early. You have to treat these cows when they're, and these calves when, you know, when, when they're spiking a fever. Because when the lung gets, to this, gets this far, you're just not going to be able to do much about it. Um, the pastorella organism, again, this is a secondary problem, doesn't typically cause pneumonia all by itself, uh, but it's around. It, it's, it's, you know, cattle carry this organism, and if, so if they start to develop pneumonia, this will contribute to the problem. There's lots of pastorella bacterins out there um, that, that can, uh, can be used. I don't think people routinely use them, but if they have a problem herd, then they probably would start to incorporate that into their vaccination program. Histophilus, um, <clears throat> again, this organism can cause pneumonia all by itself. Uh, probably the, the thing to recognize about Histophilus is that it's capable of causing other kinds of problems besides just pneumonia. You can get nervous system disease with this. You can get abortion from it. You can get heart infections. And so it can present itself in a lot of different ways, and it usually doesn't do it all together. In other words, you'll get one or the other, but you won't get all of them together. Um, as a matter of fact, this winter we've seen an increase in the number of nervous system cases related to Histophilus somnus, um, um, just as an indicator of, of kind of a, of, a, of a current trend that we're seeing out there right now. Um, and it's often found in mixed infections. It'll be found with other bacteria or with other viruses. And again, there's a bacterin available for Histophilus as well, a couple of different products. So um, you, can, you can try and protect yourself against this one.
Um, as I said, Mycoplasma bovis is a is a uh, is a problem organism in cattle, and the bacteria tend to colonize the cells that line the airways. And all of these cells have little hairs on them or, or cilia, and these cilia are are active in removing uh, dust and, and pathogens and particulate matter from the airways. And so if you strip the cilia or inactivate the cilia on those cells, they can't do their job. And so now the lung is vulnerable to dust, to bacteria, to particles, and, and all of these things can, can work at creating a worse case of respiratory disease. So Mycoplasma bovis tends to to open the lung up to all kinds of problems and formation of abscesses in the lung and, and lets other bacteria in. And so it really is a, a, a troublesome bacteria. And as I say, it can, it can cause lots of other problems um, throughout the body. There are, some, there are some drugs that are labeled. I think I've got them listed there. And then yet there are some Bactrins available too. But I think this is an organism that more and more people are, are experiencing frustration with and, and uh, having to deal with. Uh, and we certainly see it um, a lot more than we used to. And then this terrible looking lung here is just a bunch of abscesses. And this is, a, this is an organism called actinomyces. Again, not a primary pathogen, can't cause pneumonia all by itself, but it just shows up later on and causes a lot of chronic changes, scar tissue, abscesses. And these kinds of changes in lungs are, you cannot reverse. They're not going to get better. So animals like this that, 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 are, that have chronic respiratory disease, um, you know, you're, you're best to cull them because you're, you're not going to get these better. They're, they're just, they're too far down the road. So <clears throat> I think most of you have seen animals that have had these kinds of problems. Uh, you know, you know how they act. You know what they look like. Uh, and these clinical signs are what you're going to have to pick up on to decide, um, you know, are you going to collect samples for diagnostic work? Are you going to in institute some, some treatment? Are you going to make some management decisions? But um, depending upon what you're dealing with and what stage you're in, you'll see, you know, different variations on these kinds of, uh, on these kinds of clinical signs. I think you have to mention that um, viral infections in general, uh, when, when they get into a herd, let's talk about BRSV, um, you will get a high number of animals affected. They'll, get, they'll run fevers, they'll go off feed, they'll feel lousy, but you won't see that many that will necessarily die. You'll just uh, have to kind of weather the storm to get through the viral infection because you can't really treat for the virus. You can treat for the, you can do some symptomatic treatment, but you can't do anything to get rid of the virus um, other than possibly vaccinate in the middle of an outbreak. Uh, but what happens is the bacteria get involved, and so secondary bacterial infections make the situation much worse. And those are the animals that die, the ones that have bacterial co-infections or are infected with a primary, primary um, bacterial mnemonic agent that can actually you know, kill them like Mannheimia. Uh, so mixed infections are far worse. You, I, I think you'd much rather have a pure viral infection if you could get it and just get through with it. And, and, and let those animals recover and come back. But the bacterial infections are much tougher to turn around and you'll have more animals die when, the, when, you, when you're dealing with those. Okay, let's switch gears here and look at, at some of the diseases that infect, affect the nervous system. And there's a, there's a list there. Um, as far as, as uh, the lab goes, the, fir the top uh, one, two, three, four, five would be the ones that we primarily deal with. Um, rabies, listeriosis, and thrombo are bacterial infections, and then lead poisoning, and then polio is, is actually a, well, it's essentially a sulfur problem in, in cattle. The, 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 the bottom three are, are more sporadic and, and, um, and, and not, as, not as commonly uh, diagnosed. I have to put a slide up on rabies because if I don't, then I, I, I can't live with myself. Um, Remember that North Dakota has plenty of rabies, and skunks are the number one carrier of rabies in the upper Midwest. Um, I've become a great respecter of this disease, and, and everybody who uh, you know, is, is out in a, in a setting where skunks can show up need to be aware of it. Anytime you see an animal that's demonstrating signs of nervous system trouble, you have to think about rabies first. And so if these animals look like they're having trouble chewing or swallowing, do not stick your hand in their mouth. I know it sounds obvious, but I can't tell you how many cases I've had come in the diagnostic lab where people have done just that. And then it turns out that it's a rabies case and they have to go get treat, you know, go get the shots for the, 
um, for prophylaxis. So always keep this in the back of your mind. You know, talk to your veterinarian about what you're dealing with because uh, more often than not, I you know the the surprise cases occur where you have an animal that you you know you think oh that can't be rabies and then it actually turns out to be you know, rabies in fact. So keep it at the top of the list and don't forget uh, you know that it's out there. And and, uh, and cows that develop rabies are getting exposed to skunks. That's how they're picking it up. Of the bacterial diseases to talk about, we need to talk about listeria, uh, which is uh, a bacterial disease that's associated with the feeding of silage, um, causes a, um, a neurologic disease in cattle, and it affects a certain portion of their brain. You don't see a lot of listeria. It's usually a premise-related problem where, where there may be a bad uh, bunch of silage that's being fed, and a and, and person may lose a few animals. Um, but we always look for it because it, it is um, common enough that it needs to be checked for. The thing you should remember about uh, listeria is that it is a zoonotic disease, meaning that it can be transmitted um, from, from animals to people. This wouldn't be a, uh, you know, a, a very common occurrence, but if you had an animal, let's say, that was aborting from listeria, you could possibly become exposed if you were pulling a calf on that animal or handling uh, fetal tissues or placenta or something. So, um, so this is one of those... Um, one of those organisms that can affect both animals and people. And then this picture just shows you the portion of the brain. You see all these little red dots down here. These are areas that have been affected by the listeria bacteria. And that's, that's the region of the brain that's affected the brain stem or the bottom portion of the brain. The other bacterial disease, this is that organism that you've seen before, is Staphylus. This is this is caused uh, this causes neurologic disease in cattle as well, and it targets blood vessels. That's where the bacteria likes to go, and uh, causes inflammation. and um, And by the time that this is occurring in a cow in a cow's brain, you're not going to do much about it. It's very hard to treat. Um, the bacterins, and I don't know the answer to this as I'm as I'm speaking about it. It didn't occur to me, but I don't know if these bacterins are licensed for neurologic histophilus. I think it's probably for the respiratory mm -hmm. uh, variety. Um, so this is a um, this is the one that we're seeing a little bit more of this winter. We've had several cases of this pop up, and it tends to be a seasonal disease. I, I don't know why the neurologic form would be more common, but we definitely have had an uptick in the in the number of cases. And so here's a brain from an animal that's affected, and you see these big areas that look red, dark red to bloody. That's those are areas in the brain where the blood vessel's been affected, and and it's. Uh, you know, it's actually bled out into the brain a little bit, but that's those are cases of what what thrombo looks like. Lead poisoning um, almost always seen in the spring in calves. They when the snow melts, they find a battery and they lick on it and they get they get lead poisoning. And it doesn't take much lead to kill them. Um, there are some other sources out there depending upon what it, you know uh, each premise that might be affected, but typically we see it in cases with batteries. These animals will show you some blindness and staggering, and, and this is tested in the lab by looking at either whole blood or, or um, tissue, and we just test for the lead levels. But this is pretty common. If we have a case where we'll have a calf comes in that died suddenly and nobody really knows what's going on, a lot of those will turn out to be lead cases. Polio is... Um, it's a complicated disease. When I was in vet school, it used to be so easy. We just thought about it as being related to thiamine deficiency. Well, somebody went and did some research on that and debunked that whole thing. And now it's pretty much associated with elevated sulfur intake. And so uh, people with, with polio problems in their herd need to look at, you know, the total sulfur intake in their animals, not just what might be in the feed, but you need to have your water looked at as well and, and think about what both are contributing to the um, to the sulfur levels, uh, but what it does is it causes a degeneration in the in the in the cortex or the or the gray matter of the brain. Um, it does seem to respond to thiamine treatment, but I don't think they really know what the association between those two, uh, with, the, with those you know, with treatment and response to treatment is. But it certainly is a good reason to use thiamine if you have an animal that's affected. It's just that there's not a clear, um, direct connection between those those two things. Um, and so, so what uh, what happens is that that the, the rumen converts this sulfur uh, this sulfur into sulfide, and then um, that causes some some energy depletion in the brain, and the brain is real sensitive to energy energy depletion, and then these animals show signs of nervous system disease. 
um, you can you can uh, evaluate the amount of sulfide in the rumen by pulling some of that gas off you know off the rumen and there are some instrumentation to do that and there are ways to do that they, they aren't common commercially yet but but there are uh, there's certainly research done that um, that evaluates uh, the rumen gas cap and how much sulfur and sulfide is in the is, is in that gas so I think there's there they're finding out more and more about this with the research that they do and uh, and we see cases of polio I would say sporadically it's not real common but what we do see some cases and I've got a picture here of a normal brain on the I guess it's on my right um, that says control on it and then you see the one on the uh, next to it you know you see how much how collapsed that brain looks and how much thinner it looks and that's just because the gray matter on that brain is degenerated and that's a pretty severe case of polio some of them aren't quite that bad but to just give you an idea of of how extreme it can be and what what can happen in some of those animals and so you can see why they act like there's something wrong with their nervous system I'm going to hit these last three just quickly, just to mention them. Nervous coccidiosis, usually related to animals that already have a coccidia infection, and um, you can't really see any any microscopic changes in the brain. But these animals clearly have neurologic disease, and they'll go down and and die. And it has something to do with some kind of a of a byproduct from the coccidial infection, but. The the anecdotal stuff that I hear about this are cows that go down after they come out of a chute, they'll just drop. And but typically they already have some kind of coccidial infection uh, in the intestine. Um, I'm gonna jump to the next big category, which is gastrointestinal disease. The reason that I put this slide up here is just to give you an idea of when you could reasonably expect some of these things to occur uh, because not all infectious agents are able to show up at the same time and so this is just sort of a um, of a chart with uh, reasonable uh, expectation of timing as you can see like the bottom one there co uh, coccidiosis needs a couple of weeks to to show up in calves as opposed to E. coli which can show up just in you know a couple of days um, just a word about E. coli. This is a huge topic. You, I can't possibly cover it, in, in, you know. Uh, but but obviously it's a bacterial infection in the small intestine, and it's going to affect the lining of the intestine. It's going to cause a diarrhea where there's loss of fluid, um, and and so these these animals are putting out tremendous amounts of fluid in their fecal matter, and they're dying of dehydration essentially more than they're dying of the bacterial infection. There are lots of different kinds of E. coli, and just because a calf has E. coli in its intestine doesn't mean anything. It has to be a disease-causing type of E. coli, so you, that's the value of diagnosing what's going on because you need to know if the E. coli that's there is, you know, means anything. Um, so there are some products out there that can help you with this, but it, it is important to know what kind of E. coli you're dealing with, and uh, and when you have animals that are affected with with this type of infection to replace fluids is as important as anything because that's why they're dying a few kinds of viruses that are important rotavirus number one um, again this is a you know a sporadic infection that we see from time to time you can vaccinate for this um, it's going to cause a similar kind of diarrhea as E. coli this this loss of fluid um, it, it has it, it does affect the, the the small intestine but the, again the biggest problem is the fact that the animals losing fluids just like um, like E. coli and, and and as in cases of pneumonia these these agents will often occur together so you get you'll get an enteritis in a calf that's caused by both E. coli and rotavirus or E. coli and something else the other virus that we see sometimes is coronavirus and this is um, this this will do similar things to the as we talked about with rota, except that sometimes you'll get some blood with coronavirus in the fecal matter, and I think that's because coronavirus damages the the lining of the intestine a little bit more. But again, you can vaccinate for this, um, and so there are there are some ways to protect um, calves from this problem, uh, especially if they're getting a good a good load of colostrum, as we talked about earlier. They, it'll help them a lot in, in whether or not they break with coronavirus. And, and these viruses are going to be put into the environment by animals that are carriers that are shedding it. And, and so, you know, it's hard to identify those animals sometimes. This is just a little schematic to just show you what a virus does to the intestine. 
the normal lining of the intestine is on on, on, my, on the left of the screen as I'm looking at it. And, and so that's lined by nice chubby cells that, that, that are doing what they're supposed to do, absorbing nutrients. And, and the one on the right side is damaged, and you can see how the cells aren't as healthy looking. And, and so that's really what the virus does. It just it, it damages the, the lining of the intestine, makes it inefficient to absorb nutrients, and makes it lose fluid. And if you can wait for the virus to get through the animal system, those cells will come back, and you'll get a normal, a relatively normal gut again. But if you, if the animal's losing too much fluid, it's going to die of fluid loss and electrolyte imbalances before the intestine will repair itself. And that's that's why they, that's why scourers is such a terrible problem. And calves will kill them before they, before their gut can repair itself. The only real parasite that I, I'll talk about coccidia in a minute, but cryptosporidium is a parasite in calves that um, it, it's it's sort of a I don't know sort of a question mark in my mind. It it it's not an invasive organism. It just sits on the lining of the intestine and causes problems with absorption. Uh, but it usually occurs with something else. You don't see cryptosporidium really being a problem all by itself. But it's a problem when it's when it's there with E. coli or with rotavirus or something else. It, it's it's one of those secondary problems that comes in. It's difficult to treat. There's no vaccine for it. And so you wouldn't know you had this unless you sent a sample to the diagnostic lab and they identified it. And then you could get together with your veterinarian and decide what you needed to do. Salmonella is um, a serious bacteria. And uh, cross-species salmonella can cause disease, so calves aren't unique. People can get salmonella infections. Which is a good reason why you need to be, you know, have good hygiene when you're handling animals that have scours because you can get some of this yourself and, and you don't want it. So you want to wear gloves or wash your hands. But salmonella bacteria is invasive, it can cause tissue damage, and so these animals will have blood in their diarrhea and they will be sick. And, and often the cows can get sick from salmonella as well. So that could be a clue to you that you maybe are dealing with this, with this bacteria because this one's. Um, able to do some um, some damage beyond just you know normal um, uh, fluid diarrhea. The, the, this can actually get in and cause some systemic disease and and do some some bad things. So um, there are bacterians out there for Salmonella. I don't think that people are crazy about them. And, uh, you know as far as how efficacious they are, but um, in some cases if there's a real problem they may be appropriate. Um, Here's a picture of, a, of an intestine that's affected by salmonella. And the thing to look at is this, this intestine is cut open and laid flat, and you see that tube, that tubular structure running down the middle of the intestine. All that is is dead um, intestinal cells and inflammatory material, and it just forms a big tube. And so you can see that salmonella completely strips the, the intestine of, of anything useful, and that will eventually pass in the fecal matter. And in fact, you might see those. Those, those kind of um, um, those casts or those inflammatory casts coming out of animals, they'll they'll actually defecate those right out of their intestine because they're just loose in there. And that's if you see that, that's a bad sign. That means you're probably going to lose that animal because they they're they're not going to repair that that stretch of intestine. It's just too much damage. So if you do see blood in the feces, there's your list of things to think about: Clostridium and Salmonella, Coccidia. BVD and coronavirus would be the ones that I would be thinking about. Some some pathogens don't don't cause bleeding in the bowel, and so you know if you do see blood, it helps you at least make a short list of things that that might be there, and and uh, and of course you need to to try and narrow that down by some diagnostic work. I'm just going to show you a few pictures here of intestine. Here's a nice green intestine. This is pretty normal for anything that's starting to decompose or rot. So as you look at this, it doesn't really doesn't tell me much of anything and this is you know anytime you opened up a calf that died of something you could see you could see gut that looked like this but if you see something that looks like this where you have a real regional area of reddening like this where I'm drawing the arrow along here this tells you that it's probably um, you know you're, you're probably dealing with something real this is probably a bacterial infection because only a, a certain part of the bowel is infected rather than the whole thing looking red and, and kind of green colored if you open that up, you can see there's normal intestine on the top there. It looks kind of tan colored, but you can obviously see there's a problem at the bottom too with all that blood. Um, so this would be something like Clostridium perfringens or um, Salmonella could do this too.
here's a here's a section of bowel. Um, you know, you're focusing on the test in, in the intestine, but your clue here in the, is in the middle instead. This big white round structure you see here is a lymph node. And when you get big lymph nodes and pieces of intestine, that tells you that there's some inflammation there. And um, and that's just because the lymph node is responsible for the immune response in the gut. And if if it's responding to something, it gets big. And so this is you know this is a case of enteritis in the calf too that that was a bacteria. A couple of more cases of Salmonella type diseases. When you open this intestine up and look at it, it looks real rough. And and uh, and this is just more infl inflammation and dead cells that line the intestine. Disease that cause oral ulcers, there's a short list. The ones with the stars by them are foreign animal diseases, and we do not want those in North Dakota. But you always have to kind of, in the back of your mind, think about that when you have oral ulcers. It's like, obviously much more likely we would have BVD or, 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 or rough feed stuffs that would be causing it. But, um, but part of our job as a lab is to, is to think about those other diseases as well. Picture here of some oral ulcers. You can see how that's the the um, gums on this calf are are worn down to the to the red tissue. And then here the tongue on this one pulled out. You can see actually the only normal part of the tongue here is down at the white tip. Now all of this is stripped off. You can see why. Um, and actually, I think this is foot and mouth disease that was taken at a, at Plum Island Lab in in. Uh, New York, but you can see why that's so painful. Who would want to eat with a tongue like that? It would be really, it would really hurt. This is a piece of small intestine from an animal affected by BVD, and the thing to look at is this dark area down here on the bottom, if I can find it, right down here, where that, where that arrow is showing up on the bottom. That's kind of reddened. If you cut that intestine open and look at it, this is what you would see. You got that little spot, that little yellow spot it looks like mucus on the surface there that's a little spot of dead tissue that the BVD virus targets and that's you know sort of characteristic for BVD infections those kinds of ulcerations okay I'm going to finish up quickly here with just a couple comments about diseases in muscle because there's just a, a, a couple I think that that occur enough that I should just mention them to you one of them is what you would know as white muscle disease uh, or vitamin E selenium deficiency um, we see this sporadically uh, depending upon some kind of nutritional problem in the animal and uh, vitamin E and selenium have antioxidant properties and if they're not present then, then you get some some damage in the muscle the other way that we can get um, degenerative disease in muscle is some kind of a toxic agent and plants occasionally cause it but more often it's it's some kind of a feed mixing problem or you might get too much of an of some in this case menensin in feed and, and that can cause, um, especially in horses, uh, not so much in cattle, but, but you can get some pretty dramatic changes in muscle. So here's some heart tissue uh, from an animal that's affected with, um, I think this was a menensin case, but you see these big pale areas in the heart, and that's pretty typical. A heart should be kind of a red-brown color, and if you're seeing some big pale areas in it, that's not a good thing, and that's a sign that you have tissue damage. Over here on these cross sections of heart, you see all these pale areas here. That's the same, the same phenomenon. That muscle is just not working well anymore. And then I'm going to just wrap it up with um, one inflammatory disease in muscle that everybody's familiar with, and that's black leg. And, and the reason I mention it is because, um, you know, while it is sporadic, it does show up every once in a while. It's caused by a Clostridium bacteria that's found in the soil. And the theory is that cattle ingest this bacteria, uh, you know, when they're feeding, and the bacteria stays in the body, and then some sort of a traumatic event or, or some kind of an event in the body causes those bacteria to multiply and release a toxin that, that damages muscle tissue. And so you get this dark red black muscle that gives the disease its name. You know, that's why we call it black leg. The thing about black leg is there's a great vaccine available and it's not expensive and people should use it because it's always the best animals that get black leg and you know and die from it and it gets to be expensive uh, when it happens. So um, I think vaccinating for black leg is really a good idea. Here's a picture of the disease here and you can see where it gets its name. It looks black and that's just because all that muscle tissue is dead and um, and uh, falling apart. And then I think. I got one picture of a heart that's affected by black leg just to tell you that there is a variation on the theme of this disease where the heart is affected.
And so you may not actually see it in the muscle when, uh, in, in these kinds of cases because it's in fact the heart that's showing the problem. And I think, whoops, I got one more. This is an injection site. <laughs> just, to, just to warn you um, that, that when you do um, put a needle in a muscle, there's a reaction. And that you can see all that pale area is dead. And then that the dark red to black on the on the outside of it there that's around it is just uh, blood and muscle tissue that's degenerating. So you you got to be careful about uh, about vaccinating in in large muscle groups like that. And I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. Okay. So thank you. I'll try to answer any questions. Um, that was kind of fast, but uh, I, I think I hit the big stuff. Thank you, Dr. Dyer. Are there any questions out there? I'll wait for a second. Yeah, we have one here at Lemoore, uh, this biomass question was, does that control E. coli? I guess some of the salesmen are saying that it does. Anybody know the answer to that? Oh. Biomass? Monooligosaccharides. Oh, okay. Um, well, I may have to have Jerry help me with this. I'm not, I'm not as clinical as I used to be. I'm guessing what they're trying to do is protect the lining of the intestine from the E. coli attaching to it. Um, that's going to depend upon the type of E. coli involved again because there's there's several different types and the ways that they attach to the intestine vary. So, um, Jerry, have you got any information on that? You know, I tried to track some of this stuff down one time, Carl. It wasn't really successful. There's almost no scientific literature that demonstrates efficacy of this stuff. It's it's observational anecdotal, and I don't mean to discount that sort of thing, but I guess you'd like to see a little bit more than just observational anecdotal data as to whether it works or not, because that's really the question. If I use this, can it help? And I, I can't answer that question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Did I lose him? Hey, Carl, if you're talking, you must be on mute. <laughs> now I'm on mo mo mute again. Jerry, I was going to say, um, from a nutritional standpoint, I think you're right. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence out there that shows that it does work in certain instances, but um, there's not a lot of depth of data to really show that. I'm sure Alltech would probably dispute some of that comment, but uh, they are a supplier of what called biomass, in certain situations, it does seem to show up, and it's become more prevalent now. And people have used it testimony-wise, show that there is some effect, So, especially in baby calf scours. Yeah, and, I, and Carl, I don't mean to leave the wrong impression. If, if there's data out there, I'd be more than willing to, to change my mind if, if I saw something. That's for and, sure. And I haven't seen it either. So, But that was a question we had right that I had from uh, down in um, uh, McIntosh County. That was, what feed additives can you put in to control calf scour's coccidiosis. And I think the question revolves around biomass and ionophores, but is it in the cow herd or the calf or both? What's your what's your view, viewpoints? Well, I, I think ionophores work. Um, I don't know, again, a biomass I'm not that familiar with. Um, but you, if, it's a, if you're looking for a coccidious stat, I, I would think you'd be feeding it to the calves because they're, they're the ones who are going to be susceptible to the problem. and, and they're the ones who are going to break with disease, and yeah, I mean, I almost never see it. I don't see many adult cows with coccidia. You know, a lot of younger animals. But yeah. I think the question relates around trying to reduce the incidence by feeding one incident to the cow herd prior to calving or during calving. What do you think? Well, I, and I'll take a stab at it and let Carl and Neil jump in here too. But I think there's only one ionophore that's labeled to be used in adult beef cows. Is that right, Carl? I think it's monensin. Okay. Now, will remensin or monensin reduce the, perhaps the level of shedding of coccidia in the environment? Could be. And that's the idea, of course, because there's no way to get it into the calves unless you want to formulate some type of method where they're going to get it into their system. Now, I don't know what that is. So that's the only logic behind feeding cows remensin is to cut down on shedding. And, and anecdotally, again, some people have thought it made a difference. That's, that's my best answer. Mm 